Let every little thing that disturbs us this moment be offered into the hands of the Lord. As we take a reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 onwards. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, a lot of the feasts of our Blessed Mother are celebrated in the Church. Down through traditions, feasts that are very dear to the hearts of different people, different cultures, but one feast that has always been so dear to all our hearts, irrespective of place, irrespective of land and country, irrespective of culture or language, is the feast of the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother. A feast that has a very long tradition to it, starting way back in the 18th 8th century, when tradition used to have this idea about the Immaculate Conception of our Blessed Mother. And much later, though this was there all through tradition, much later, in 1854, it was declared as a dogma by Pope Pius IX, a moment of rejoicing in the Church. Rejoicing in the church for declaring a truth, a truth that is very dear to our hearts about our own Blessed Mother, the Immaculate Conception of Mary. In the Bible, we read about the angel coming and giving an exhortation to the Blessed Mother. Standing in front of her, in verse 28 of Luke chapter 1, we read the angel says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. The starting words of our prayer, the Hail Mary. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Dear brothers and sisters, for that young virgin, Mary, this was a very, very special exhortation. For if we see the Israelite tradition all through the Bible, we'll understand that the Israelites always considered the angels to be greater beings than themselves. That was true. Angels were beings who were close to God. 
they were pure, they were holy, they were special to God. They were a being that was much greater than that of humans. But here suddenly an angel coming and greeting Mary with these words were disturbing for Mary. That's why the word tells in verse 29. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. For this was not common. For the Israelites, if ever they saw an angel who would come to give a message, they would kneel down for they would say, we have seen the glory of God. And here suddenly, roles are reversed. The angels stand in front of a woman, a little virgin, and looks at her and says, Hail, full of grace. Hail, you're full of grace. Dear brothers and sisters, a grace-filled Mary. That is the angel's exhortation. A grace-filled Mary. A woman who was grace-filled from the very time that she was born in her mother's womb. Why? Obviously because this woman was to carry the Son of God. Her womb was to carry the Son of God. And that was something special. A place that is pure and holy for the Son of God to be in for those nine months or so. And that is why God deemed it fit that Mary should be without sin even the moment she was born. That is from where the tradition has it that she is without sin from her birth. The indication of this exhort exhortation was so clear. She was pure. She was pure because she was bringing in the one who was pure and is pure and will ever be pure, Jesus Christ. Jesus was born into this world. Before that, he was born in her womb. And even before that, he was born in her heart. A heart that was filled with purity. A heart that was filled with grace. Dear brothers and sisters, a grace-filled mother is who we see. But if that is the idea of the Immaculate Conception, which is true, there is something that is also indicative in this particular dogma that we teach, we believe and we study. The fact that not only was she grace-filled initially, she was grace-filled all throughout her life. True, she got that grace. But what was more important was what she did with that grace. The beauty with which she approached that grace. The fact that she never let that grace go away. Never let that grace be empty. She kept that grace alive. What was this grace? Evelyn Underhill says beautifully when she says, Grace is God himself. Grace is God himself, his energy at work within our souls. Grace is God himself, his loving energy at work within our souls. And that was what was happening to Mary. It was God within herself, his loving energy within herself, within her own soul. And the fact was, this little virgin kept it pure and holy. She never let that grace go away. She used that grace to do something for mankind. She used that grace to grow in holiness. Not only was she immaculately conceived when she was in her mother's womb, but the fact is, she held on to that beautiful grace. And she made it alive in her life. How did Mary make this alive in her life? We read, Mary is seen as a worthy daughter. One who grew up in holiness of God. Someone or a person who would make any parent proud. 
a holiness within herself. And definitely the traditions in the church speak about Anna and Mary. Anne and Mary, the mother of Ma Mother Mary and Mary herself. The traditions give beautiful stories about them. A mother who would have been proud of her daughter. Her grace that was that she received initially, she lived it as a beautiful daughter. It didn't end with that. She became a beautiful wife. A wonderful wife who became obedient to Joseph. Wherever he took her, she would obey and go with him. In quietness, in silence and in holiness, she became a wonderful wife. And then she became a wonderful mother, a grace-filled mother, a mother who protected her child with her own life. We read in the Gospel of Matthew, they had to escape to Egypt, fearing what would happen, for the angel appeared to Joseph in Matthew chapter 2 verse 13, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. Mother Mary, the word tells us, goes along with Joseph. It wasn't easy for her. She was a pregnant woman. She would have her own discomforts, her own difficulties. But there was one thing that was utmost in her mind and that was her little son in her womb. Became a loving mother, a protective mother. To the extent that we read in Matthew chapter 2 verse 16 onwards, when Herod is massacring those little infants, Mother Mary is fleeing from place to place, protecting her child. That protection does not end when he's in her womb, even after that. We read when, Mary, when Jesus is lost in the temple, Mary goes searching frantically for her son. A wonderful mother. Even when Jesus grows up and people are not very impressed by Jesus, when the scribes and the Pharisees go against the Lord, even saying and passing rumors that the man has gone out of his mind, he's insane. Mother Mary goes to his defense. She's there by him. A loving mother. A mother who stood at the foot of the cross, never abandoning her own son. That grace that she received, she kept it and she lived it to become a good mother. Not only that, she became a good and beautiful disciple of Christ. Something that is a call given to each one of us. The model of discipleship is Mary. All throughout, from the very start of her life, she was a disciple. Being one with God. Being faithful to God. She lived her discipleship. She lived her vocation. Even to the extent when all the other disciples ran away, she stood by Jesus. She held his body in her arms. She was faithful. She became a true disciple. Dear brothers and sisters, it didn't end with that. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, we see suddenly a mother who is becoming an inspiration for others. A hope for others. When she sat with the disciples in prayer during those days of the Pentecost, when the disciples sat in fear, when the disciples sat because they didn't know where to go, what to do, who to turn to, the grace-filled Mary sat with them and prayed. And we see the moment of the Pentecost. She became an inspiration and a hope for others. Dear brothers and sisters, Mary not only was grace-filled at the moment of her birth, she was grace-filled all throughout. She received that grace 
And she lived that grace. She made something out of the grace that she received. What does this mean to us today? True, unlike Mary, we were born with original sin. But the moment we were baptized in Christ, all that original sin was washed away and wiped away completely. And at that moment, we came into a grace-filled life. We who got that grace-filled life as Christians baptized in Him, have we kept that grace? What have we done with that grace over the years? Have we made it meaningful? Maybe more towards after baptism, whenever we went for confession, after confession we would be grace-filled, holy, pure and white as snow, as the word of God tells us. Though your sins may be as scarlet, I will make it white as snow. Let it be like crimson, I will make it like wool. In the confession, it's all washed away. Once again, we are grace-filled. What do we do with that grace? Every day in the Holy Eucharist, when we receive the Lord in Holy Communion, the Lord takes control of our body, mind and soul. We become grace-filled. After being filled with that grace in Holy Communion during the Eucharist, what have we done with that grace? Like Mary, have we lived that grace? Have we made meaning to the grace that we have? Are we becoming good children to our parents? Being worthy of, of, of being a child of God? Are we becoming worthy parents? Grace-filled parents passing on the grace of Christ to our children. Protecting them from the evils of this world with prayer and love. What kind of a spouse are we becoming? Are we becoming a grace-filled spouse? A grace-filled husband and a grace-filled wife? Are we becoming a faithful disciple? Like Mary was a faithful disciple, are we able to become grace-filled disciples? Faithful to Him in love. Never moving away from Him irrespective of what our situations and our problems are. Irrespective of how difficult life is. Are we becoming grace-filled children of God? grace-filled vocations? Are we becoming inspirations of hope to others like Mary was? Dear brothers and sisters, every baptism, every confession, every Eucharist is an indication to each one of us that we are grace-filled. When we receive that grace, we cannot hold it just within ourselves. The importance is, what do we do with that grace? Are we making it alive? Are our lives portraying this grace? Today maybe that is what the Lord is questioning us. Maybe today that is what Mother Mary is exhorting us. Be grace-filled and make use of the grace that the Lord has given you. Let us take Mary as the epitome of discipleship. Let us take Mary as the epitome of grace. And let us try and live that kind of a grace-filled life that she lived. Being one with her in prayer, asking for her intercession. Today it is sad that many of us barely give importance to our Blessed Mother. We don't go deeper into what she was to understand how beautifully she lived her vocation. Maybe we have been very casual about things, casual about the sacrifices Mother Mary made. 
Today we have a lot of people speaking against our Blessed Mother. Giving us wrong indication and wrong ideas. And we are getting carried away. Forgetting what Mother Mary's life meant to us. I remember a couple who came to me. Quite elderly. Their grandchild was suffering from cancer. A small little baby having leukemia. And the grandparents just didn't know what to do. Their children had moved away from the church. And the children would always keep looking at the grandparents and saying, this faith that you have in Mother Mary, the intercessions that you're making, asking Mother Mary's intercession is wrong. And that is why the child is sick. There were people who would come into their houses and so rudely tell them, it is because of this prayer that you're making to the Blessed Mother, the child is sick. Leave all this. And that is the state in which this grandparents reached me. As they spoke to me, we closed our eyes in prayers. And after we opened our eyes, I told them, you go back home and you recite four rosaries every day. They went back home. They recited those rosaries every day. They came for yet another retreat a few months back. And they gave their testimony about when they went back home with great difficulty, how they fought that battle, sat in prayer reciting the rosary. Those four rosaries being faithful to the Blessed Mother. And they said, barely three months later, this child who was suffering from leukemia was totally cured by the miracle and intercession of the Blessed Mother. They looked at me and they said, Father, today we know how powerful an intercessor we have in heaven. Dear brothers and sisters, as we celebrate this beautiful feast, let us look at the life of our Blessed Mother and derive inspiration from it to live our Christian vocation, to live it rather than to just drift in it. A person who drifts is not a Christian. A person has to live his or her Christianity. That grace that we have received through baptism, through confessions, through our Holy Eucharist, let us live it. Live it as a grace-filled Christian. Let us close our eyes. And let us offer ourselves unto the Lord today. Let us thank Jesus for what we are as Christians and the blessings that have come into our life in the form of graces. And let us ask the Lord to give us the grace to be always faithful to Him, to make the graces we have received alive in our life, to live good lives as children, to live good lives as parents, to live graceful lives as spouses, to live holy lives as disciples. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all.